Good day grade 12s, my name is Viola from the Distinction Bound Student and I'd like to welcome you to Lesson 92 from the Distinction Bound Student Textbook written by Cardin Madzokir. In this lesson we are going to look at the appropriateness of the industrial policies of South Africa. As usual we start off our lesson by revising homework activity 81 on page 192 given in Lesson 91. Question 1. What do we call the process whereby indigenous people are empowered in development? Two marks. That would be Skills Support Program, SSP. Question 2. What do we call a cash grant for projects that require new, expanded or improved infrastructure? Two marks. Our answer is Critical Infrastructure Program. Question 3. Attracting infrastructure and businesses to underdeveloped areas is known as what? Two marks. Spatial Development Initiatives. That's it for our homework. Let's now look at Unit 4, The Appropriateness of the Industrial Policies of South Africa. This is the last lesson under Industrial Development Policies before the test on the topic which will be Lesson 93. Let's dive into the lesson. Appropriateness of National Policies The NIPF on which IPAP 1 and IPAP 2 were based was a well-designed and resourced program. Remember we covered the National Policy Framework and Industrial Policy Action Plan in Lesson 89 linked down below. South Africa's national industrial policy adheres to international best practice in the following aspects. Infrastructure investment, technology, competition, creative development and lastly human capital. Let's start with infrastructure investment. Investing in the maintenance and expansion of Africa has investment. Programs that include infrastructure such as railways, roads, ports, electricity and water. Next up is technology. Companies are encouraged to increase their technological know-how and to apply it to the product improvement process. Technologically advanced businesses have a greater potential for exporting their products. Think about technologically advanced companies like Naspers here in South Africa that own the likes of Media24, News24, Career24, MultiChoice, Take a Lot and Mr. D. You can agree with me that they have the capability to export their services beyond South African borders. Let's move on to competition. Companies are more focused, innovative and effective if strong competition is present. Why do you think that is the case? Let us know your thoughts in the comments section down below. Also like and subscribe to our channel. It's absolutely free to do so. Turn on the notification bell for you to get notified each time we post. Competition improves the overall quality of the manufactured product. As with technological advancement, high-quality products can more easily be exported and compete on an international level. Do you think South African products are good enough to compete on the export market? Let's now look at creative development. All businesses are encouraged to continually conduct research and to develop new products. These days with the internet, research has become easily accessible and affordable. Platforms like YouTube make it even easier. Shout out the YouTube team for bringing us this amazing platform. As with research and new product development, intellectual capital is at risk of falling into the hands of competitors. For this reason, intellectual capital is protected by copyright and patents. Many people understand copyrights but not patents so let me help you with that. A patent is the granting of a property right by the government to an inventor of a product. So this grant provides the inventor exclusive rights to the patented product. So it makes you more like a monopoly. Do you think it's a good thing for you to become the only person legally allowed to make something that you invented? Let's hear your thoughts in the comments section down below. Lastly we will look at human capital. The development of human capital through skills development is of critical importance, as skilled employees are more productive than untrained employees. By investing in human capital, a country is assured of having long-term economic growth. Remember in the 83 under the topic economic growth and development, we listed characteristics of developing countries and one of them was low levels of productivity. I'm sure you agree with me that it is caused by not being adequately trained. Let's now do a mini-evaluation of South Africa's industrial development policies in which we will look at its success factors, external constraints and finally internal constraints. We start off with success factors. Interventions in industries were based on sound economic research and analysis. There was substantial progress and growth in the upgrading of value-adding and labor-intensive manufacturing sectors. Great success was achieved in combating customs fraud and targeting illegal imports and products of inferior quality. An alignment of trade policy with industrial policy took place. This resulted in South African industries being more competitive in global markets. Do you agree with these success factors? Do you think there is an exaggeration on any of these factors? We are curious to know what your thoughts are on this. 
On external constraints. The implementation of the NIPF and IPAP 1 and 2 overlapped with one of the worst global recessions since the Great Depression. This had a great impact on South Africa as a developing country. The manufacturing sector was the hardest hit. The exchange rate could not stabilize the production sectors of the economy resulting in slow economic growth and development in the industrial sectors. The global recession resulted in a decrease in the demand for goods and services from traditional export countries such as the United States and the European Union. Lastly, internal constraints. The increase in the electricity and logistics costs in the country was a big blow to a rapid growth rate in the industrial sector of the economy. These price hikes affected the smaller businesses and many were forced bankruptcy. Slow progress was made with regard to addressing skill shortages. CETAs did not achieve their aims with billions of rand not used or either not used well. There were backlogs in infrastructure expenditure at all levels of government. That's it with national policies on industrial development. Let's zoom into the country a bit more and evaluate the appropriateness of regional development policies. I'm sure you remember what a region is. Remember in Lesson 90 when I said Limpopo is a region, and so on. Development within the industrial development zones, IDZs has been slow. Only two zones are fully established and operating. Regional development is still uneven. Economic activities are concentrated in the four metropolitan regions. The industrial development zones, IDZs, did not attract as much local and international investor interest as expected. Workers still have to move to where employment is. Remember in grade 11 we said one of the characteristics of labor is that it is immobile, and for sure, this becomes a constraint to the appropriateness of regional development policies. Let us now turn our attention to small business development. The promotion of entrepreneurship has been achieved. Which by the way is a very good thing. The main task of the Department of Trade and Industry, DTI, is to promote small enterprises in partnership with the Center for Small Business Promotion, CSBP, and SICA Enterprise Promotion Agency. Improved access to finance, capital, information, and advice has provided effective incentives for small businesses. Given a chance to choose between the four things I just mentioned, which one would you choose? I'm curious to know. I also want to know why you chose that. Cola Enterprise Finance, Business Referral and Information Network offer loans and other financial support and information. The Department of Trade and Industry, DTI, has various programs in place to support small medium and micro enterprises, SMMEs. These are mainly aimed at providing easier access to capital, information, business advice and entrepreneurial development. Now let's look at the appropriateness of broad-based black economic empowerment in the South African economy. I'm sure many are curious to know its appropriateness. The laws relating to unequal opportunity employment and the regulations relating to BEE support the South African transformation. These policies are supported by the United Nations and the World Bank, especially in terms of empowering indigenous people and the international law that recognizes the role of laws in empowering the people. Last but not least we will look at regional development on the African continent. The South African government regards the promotion of strong levels of industrialization and economic integration on the African continent as important. South Africa has played a leading role in supporting regional economic development in Africa, for example, in the activities of the African Union, AU, and the New Partnerships for Africa's Development, NEPAD. Regional development on the continent is hampered by a lack of cross-border infrastructure. I think we can add corruption at those borders too. Ask Cardin, he has been in and out of many African countries and this year alone, he has been to five African countries already and next week he is going to another. South Africa's regional approach further seeks to provide strategic direction in terms of South Africa's trade position in the Southern African Customs Union, SACU, and the SADC. We have come to the end of the most difficult topic in our grade 12 syllabus. Let me give you today's homework before I give you some advice on this topic. Our homework is Activity 82 on page 194. Question 1. Discuss any three incentive schemes which involve cash grants to promote regional industrial development. 6 marks. That's it for today's lesson. Here is my advice on the topic covered from lessons 89 to 92 which in my opinion is the most difficult in our syllabus. Well, I advise you to use the first three weeks of term 3 to focus on mastering the whole module of economic pursuits. Make a list of all policies in the module. Make sure you learn and master what each policy deals with. If you find it to be extremely difficult for you to master any of these policies, don't get completely discouraged because the module also has economic growth and development, 
which has easy content here and there. The module also has economic and social performance indicators, which is one of the easiest topics in the entire syllabus. I keep forgetting that protectionism and free trade was added to economic pursuits, which also dilutes the difficulty of economic pursuits. I hope I'm not confusing you. The only big challenge you have to deal with is industrial development policies. If none of this works, rather focus your attention on macroeconomics and avoid questions 3 and 6 in the trial and final exams. That way, I can guarantee you a comfortable pass. If you fail, I'll buy you lunch because you would have done the most difficult thing, which is failing economics. Don't forget to like and subscribe to our channel. Also hit the notification bell for you to get notified every time we post new content to our channel. We are also giving away the Distinction Bound Student t-shirts to people who buy more than 10 books. At the moment we have the following textbooks, Economics Grade 10, 11 and 12 plus Business Studies Grades 11 and 12. We are looking forward to adding more books to our catalog. Remember our books come in two versions, Complete and No Answers versions. Complete versions have answers and no answers versions do not. Thank you so much for your support. See you in the next video. God bless.